it's 7.30 now, so we're going to open up um, tonight's Zoom. Uh, as we were just saying, Roy Babich has um, an engagement party for a niece, so I have the privilege of opening up tonight. And uh, because I don't get to do this publicly, I, I can say uh, how wonderful Roy Babich is and uh, how we're very fortunate to have him as the rabbi of our synagogue. Tonight, uh, we're privileged to have uh, Randy Wynn, Dr. Wynn's son, um, who's going to introduce him. For those of you who don't know Randy Wynn, uh, he's the head of our nominating committee. He's a director at Fifth Avenue Synagogue. He's on our construction committee, and he's been a great friend and partner um, in helping push the synagogue forward. He's also a significant uh, donor to our construction project, and uh, I want to publicly thank Randy for all his time and effort and his uh, friendship over, uh, I don't know, it feels like two decades, but it's probably a little less, Randy, right? But- uh, Very close to two decades, I'm Jacob. Very close. But We're I'm not getting any younger. Neither of us are getting younger. But I'm gonna give uh, Randy the floor to introduce his uh, dynamic dad, who's gonna have a great presentation for us this evening, Randy. Jacob, thanks so much for the kind words. It's been, uh, you know, you're a force of nature and you're pushing the synagogue forward and pulling us all in your, you know, all behind you. And I'm, I'm lucky and thankful that you're doing it. Thanks a lot. Um, and Rachel, who I think was on, thank you for organizing this. Um, we appreciate it. So in any case, introduce dad. Um, what can I say? The mitzvah of honoring one's parents is known as being one of the most difficult mitzvah to perform properly. There are many aspects of performing this mitzvah. One of them is to admire your parents and consider them to be eminent people. And in my case, this aspect of the mitzvah is not challenging. My father's devoted much of his life to the study of the human brain and had a long career, which included saving many lives and training many leading neurosurgeons in the United States. Although retired from surgery, he continues to play a major role in the field as the editor of the gold standard textbook for neurosurgery, which latest edition is something like 10,000 pages and for which he's brought in, and which he brought into the modern era with online tutorials and videos. Additionally, in 2007, the Society of Neurological Surgeons established the H. Richard Wynn MD Prize. The purpose of this international award is to encourage research in the neurosciences and to recognize outstanding continuous commitment to research in neurosciences by a neurological surgeon, something to which dad has always been devoted. I know that dad's excited to share a little bit about, quote, the territory with us, and I'm very proud to introduce him to all of you on this Zoom. Over to you, dad. Well, thank you very much, Randy. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Ezra. Uh, and thank you, I want to thank Rabbi Babich, even in his absence, uh, for this honor to present to uh, uh, the Fifth Avenue. And I know I follow in some very uh, impressive foot, footsteps, large footsteps. So um, I also want to uh, uh, show this picture uh, because it subsequently, towards the end, I'm going to talk about brain augmentation. And this shows uh, the latest devices that my grandchildren and I constructed. And here we have Randy and uh, Tammy uh, trying them out. And uh, th this picture, I've got to move, hold on one second here. This picture um, shows Randy, uh, shows that he can wear a second hat. Uh, of course, this hat um, uh, induces more profound uh, effects on the brain. But here we are. Here's, here's Debbie, my wife of 57 years, Randy's mother and Allison's mother. We had just flown in, I believe, from um, Kathmandu, where we were living at the time, and of course received a very warm welcome from Ira and Inga. And I want to uh, just acknowledge that continuous uh, warm, warmth from both of them uh, after we moved uh, to, New, to New York, our time in Nepal certainly toughened us up and made us made the, our stay in in um, New York uh, possible. So here's what we're going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about, and hopefully uh, both 
the speaker, that is me, and uh, listeners, I hope, will all end at the same time. Uh, the job, I'm going to outline the job descript description and what you have to know about the territory of neurosurgery, how to become a neurosurgeon. I'm hopeful that at least half of the people listening will, after the I'm finished in two or three hours, I think Jacob said I could take two to three hours, will be competent to go out and practice neurosurgery, because as you'll see, there's a, a uh, need for more neurosurgeons. Jake wanted me to talk about my personal journey. I'm happy to address that at the end, but I think the blurb that was sent out covered most of it. And then we're going to talk about the past, present, and the, especially the future of what's new in neurosurgery. <clears throat> but first, we have to address a philosophic question. Uh, that is, is neurosurgery, quote, end quote, synonymous with brain surgery? And I think we'll look at this educational. Yeah, someone's soft, I'm driving. Parking is an absolute nightmare around here, isn't it? Has reversed into the tiniest of spaces. Still, I managed it. I mean, parking is not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> and I should know. Why is that? Are you a doctor? Careful. Not a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, I actually know a joke about this. What's the difference between a doctor and a brain surgeon? One's not exactly brain surgery. The other is brain surgery. <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you guys do? I'm an accountant. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I could do with an accountant. Filling in those tax forms can get really confusing, can't it? Still. It's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> I mean, brain surgery, believe me, is very complex. Are you an accountant too? Uh, no, I work for a charity. Oh, that's a very selfless job, isn't it? I really admire you. I don't think I could ever do what you do. <laughs> I say that because it's emotionally draining, not because it's hard. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> Which, as a brain surgeon, is what I do. Lionel, here's your drink. Lionel's a brain surgeon, you know. <laughs> yeah, he mentioned it. <laughs> oh, Jeff, they keep you late at the Space Centre. As always. This food round Have you met Lionel? Uh, no, hello, Lionel. So, Jeff, how do you earn a crust? Uh, oh, I'm a scientist. I, I work mainly with rockets. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's pretty tough work. Um, what do you do? Why? I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgery? <laughs> oh, exactly rocket science. <laughs> so, notwithstanding um, that last slide or video, neurosurgery, as you'll see from what neurosurgeons do, is not synonymous with quote, brain surgery. So, here's the territory that neurosurgeons cover. Tumors, both of the spine and brain, vascular diseases, mainly of the brain, trauma, brain and spine. And it's important to note that the leading cause of death, I think perhaps uh, even after the COVID uh, pandemic is trauma. So it's really a, a, a terrible tragedy amongst people under 40. And then here's what neurosurgeons spend most of their time doing, and that is 70% of neurosurgical neurosurg activity relates to the spine, from simple straightforward discs to complex spinal cord tumors. And the thing that's changed is that the instrumentation is much more complex, requires a great deal of experience. Infections of the brain, and abscesses of the brain and spinal cord, pituitary dysfunction. And what, 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 uh, that tumors can either cause a decrease or an increase in function. Here's the pituitary gland up here. And the pituitary gland is really called the master gland. It controls uh, activity in a variety of endocrine uh, regions. That, for example, you can be hyperthyroid or hypothyroid. And that could be because the gland isn't functioning or because it's not receiving the signal from the pituitary gland. And there's a host of other glands 
throughout the body, which are very critical for life, including uh, kidney. And here's another aspect of what neurosurgeons do, water on the brain or hydrocephalus, seen in the newborn and in the elderly. Functional disorders I'm gonna cover subsequently, but th there's a whole host of areas in functional disorders. And I think it's a really, uh, quite frankly, a growth area for neurosurgery. Peripheral nerves, again, it's part of the nervous system. Neurosurgeons deal with things like carpal tunnel, ulnar, brachial plexus problems, uh, and so forth. But here's an important facet which individuals may not uh, think about, and that is in order to be an excellent neurosurgeon, you have to be an excellent, excellent neurologist and even a excellent endocrinologist because a neurosurgeon has to discern entities simulating surgically treatable lesions. And you don't want a neurosurgeon to go and operate on something which is not a surgical lesion, such as multiple sclerosis, giant cell arteritis, a giganism, and so forth. So uh, for those of you uh, who are looking forward to obtaining an A in this course, I'm gonna recommend some additional reading. This is a quick read for maybe uh, 5,000 pages as Randy mentioned. Here's the, if you wait two months, you can get the uh, eighth edition. That's gonna be 11,000 pages with 5,000 elect electronic pages and videos and so forth. So back to the territory that neurosurgery, neurosurgery encompasses and which neurosurgeons have to be competent at. So neuroanatomy, and then we'll deal with neurophysiology. Neuroanatomy includes the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. But tonight we'll focus on the central nervous system. So what is the central nervous system? Well, it's the brain, the, the cerebrum, and the cerebrum is composed of four lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Parietal lobe is mainly involved in motor function, movement. Parietal lobe, very intimately involved in sensation. Occipital lobe, primarily involved in vision and temporal lobe, memory, but also speech and the dominant hemisphere, which in right-handed people is in the left hemisphere and in left-handed people located in the right hemisphere. Then there's the cerebrum. That's a motor, it's in control of motor coordination and it's unconscious motor coordination. So for example, you can see I'm moving my elbow here back and forth. I'm actually not thinking about, well, wait a minute, you wanna move your forearm forward, then you're gonna to have to contract the triceps, but you're gonna to have to relate, relax the biceps. That's, you just cannot possibly go through movement and think of all the different aspects of release and contracture. That's all handled by the cerebellum and all subconsciously. Then there's the brainstem. That's the inflow and out from outflow from the spinal cord and also contains the cranial nerves, the motor and sensory activity of the face and head, and then vegetative activity, such as breathing, heart rate. Uh, some cl cas uh, classify that as lower function, uh, but if it's not there, it's, it's not lower, it's very important. And then finally, the spinal cord, which is the main thoroughfare transmitting information to the brain and out of the brain to the body. Now, to put it simply, the central nervous system has just two basic functions. First is sending signals out of the brain, and that's called motor control and related to muscle movement. So I wanna move this finger, the impulse goes out of my motor cortex, as you'll see, in it's here shown in blue, goes to the finger, move the finger. And then the reverse function, receiving signals back into the brain, that's sensory perception. So for example, touching my 
for my index finger with two sharp points. And I've covered this, here's the motor cortex. That's in the back of the frontal lobe. And then there's this deep sulcus coming up here called the central sulcus. And then the somatosensory cortex right here. Now we're gonna look at this in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna take a knife. Here's a very uh, unusual neurosurgery instrument. I'm gonna slice through the central sulcus like this and then turn the brain on the on end. And here's what would be the motor strip. And we define the motor strip by seeing what is the output of these various areas. And what you can see is that, for example, the hand and the thumb are overrepresented compared to the arm, the body, the lower extremity, and the and the foot. And in the same way, the face, the lips, the tongue, again, are overrepresented. So if you look down at the brain and you stick a needle into the brain and you record activity when the finger moves, the area of the brain that is serving for hand finger function is much larger than the elbow. And think about it again, elbow only has to go like this. The fingers, hand have many more complex function. And the same is true for the face and tongue. Now, and if you wanted to then represent what a person looks like based on the area of the brain that's serving, for example, the hand, this is what the person would look like in very enlarged hand with a special over-exaggeration of the thumb and the same with the lower face. So let's turn now to the sensory side. We covered the motor cortex. Let's cover the somatosensory cortex and it's the same distribution. This is what it would look like if you drew a picture based on the area of the brain subserving sensory uh, function. And this is demonstrated perhaps by this experiment. Now I'm gonna take these, these pencils that I've taped together. They have two sharp points. And I'm gonna touch my, the finger pad of my index finger. And if my, my eyes were closed, I could say, yes, there are two points touching my finger. Now I simply now touch the back of my finger. I'd say, I'm not sure, maybe two. And as you go up your hand, no longer can you discern one or two when you get up to the elbow. There's no chance of that. Now, apply it to your lip. Absolutely clear, two points. And if you then come over here and look, you can see why. There are many more, many more neurons devoted to hand sensory input and lip sensory input than the elbow. So you can't discern two points, same distance apart at the elbow that you can easily perceive in the thumb. Now, just like there's super sense uh, specialization in the sensory and motor cortex, the same applies to the blood supply to the brain. And it's very, very tightly regulated. Think about it. When I touched my finger here, like that, on the left side of my brain, in the index finger area here, neurons started working and saying, whoa, we can feel two points touching the finger. As soon as they go to work, they expend energy. And what is energy? They consume glucose and oxygen. And that has to be replaced immediately or they won't be able to function when I touch my finger again. So the analogy that I would make is that if Amazon re receives a book order from you, Amazon will send the book out precisely to you. They don't send out a thousand books or a million books all over um, Manhattan. What would happen? What would happen is that Jeff Bezos 
and Amazon would go broke. And it's the same in the brain. There's got to be a conservation of energy and delivery precisely where energy is required. It's, uh, as you've heard from in previous speakers uh, on, on Sunday night, it's the, it's the law of economics, the law of supply and demand. So let's look and see how precise that is regulated. And this was done in the laboratory, in my laboratory uh, back in the early 80s. What we did is we did a craniotomy. That means removing the, the cover, the, the bony cover of the skull. And we're looking down on the, the brain of the animal, a rat, and we cover it with a piece of glass. Here's the side view, here's the brain. Here's the piece of glass. We've opened the bone and the covering and we bring in a microscope and we watch what happens when we stimulate uh, the brain. So this is a uh, picture of the bone opening. It's only about five millimeters. And uh, that's about, uh, as you'll see, about uh, the size of three pennies stacked on each other. So it's pretty small. And the white part is the brain. These darker vessels marked in blue are the veins. The veins are removing deoxygenated blood from the brain. And in red are the art arteries. And this is an arterial. It's about 100 microns, a tenth of a millimeter. And it's sensory hind limb cortex is right here. So here's the experiment. The rats anesthetized, respirated, so the oxygen uh, is maintained level in the lungs. This window we've made. And now we go and we find the sciatic nerve, which is the sensory input for the whole leg, lower uh, the hind limb. And we put an electrode on the sciatic nerve, which we can stimulate. Then we bring in the microscope and we focus in here. We bring it out and we make a video recording, which is shown right here. Now let's look at what happens. I'm gonna stop it for a second and just orient you. White is the brain. Here's a big vein. Here is an arteriole going to sensory hind limb cortex with an artery or a, a very small uh, artery coming out here. So let's see what happens. We're gonna stimulate this sciatic nerve and activate sensory hind limb cortex. Boom, we start stimulating the brain tissue, the neurons are consuming oxygen and they're saying, hey, we need more oxygen. And it's tightly regulated. It's not going, here's another artery. It's not, this artery is not dilating. It's only the arterial going specifically to hind limb cortex. So that's just a, oops, to make a, a slight pun, a window into the complexity as that uh, quote brain surgeon at the cocktail party stated, the brain is complex. This next video will show the amount of brain that is excited and it's using a different technique in which we're looking now not at the blood vessels, but the brain tissue that becomes excited. These dark structures here are the veins. And now you're gonna see, okay, that's the part of the brain that, sent, that is stimulated by stimulating the sciatic nerve. This is about a third of one millimeter. If this were equivalent to the hand, in the human, but in the rat, it's the whiskers coming out of you know, the nose. It would be like this, it would be huge. And even though the hind limb is bigger than the whisker. So again, it depends on function as far as the area that's inputted to the sensory area of the brain, but also the blood vessel response. And this is the little vessel that we were studying. Okay, so with that background, you're now competent in neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. 
let's look at these uh, questions. How do you become a, a neurosurgeon? Quick view of the democratic, uh, the demographics, and how are neurosurgeons made? We'll look at the neurosurgery factory. So first of all, training. Obviously, choice of the correct pre-K school, and here, of course, create a play school at Fifth Avenue. <laughs> guaranteed to go on to fame and fortune, perhaps a neurosurgeon. <laughs> You've uh, chosen the right pre uh, kindergarten, college, medical school, four years, residency, now seven years. When I finished, it was four years. Uh, and I'll uh, talk about that later. And now people go on to do fellowships, perhaps one to two years in the spine, in epilepsy, in pediatrics, so super specialization. Let's look at the demographics. This was from 2010, but the reality is not much has changed. Here we have about 250,000 plus, maybe 271,000 uh, pediatricians, uh, internists, GPs in primary care. Where's neurosurgery in this mix? Way down here at 5,000. And that hasn't really, the numbers have changed slightly, but in comparison to the expansion in the population, the ratio hasn't changed much at all. In reality, it wasn't 5,000 uh, because they were counting residents and individuals in, uh, in the military and so forth. Available for civilian care were about 3,600 3,700 practicing uh, neurosurgeons, board certified, and I'll get to that later. For 5,700 hospitals serving, this was 2010, uh, 311 million people. There's a, also a geographic maldistribution. For neuro, in Alaska, there's one per 66,000. In Washington, D.C., 19,000. Of course, that They've took into account um, the NIH, which will skew the figures somewhat. In Manhattan, it's about one per 25,000. Aging population significantly increases the conditions needing attention by a neurosurgeon. Now, here's a big factor, technology. It's expanded significantly the patient base and the treatment options. Here's another factor. There's an earlier and earlier percentage of retirement, a greater percentage of retirement of neurosurgeons. The factors contributing to that trend are unclear. And then lastly, the regulatory and training exposure constraints, which I'll talk about uh, specifically duty hours later. Here's the overall picture for physicians in general, uh, as you can see. In 2010, we're here. In 2020, an increase, but not much. In contrast, here's the demand based on expansion of the population, but also the increased capability of what we're able to diagnose and treat. And here's what it looks like for neurosurgery. Not much of a change. Some change, but not, not in keeping with the, the demands. Now, in part, this is related to a uh, lack of, of medical students graduating from U.S. medical uh, colleges and medical school. Now, how did this come about? I mean, there are many factors why we're not producing enough um, physicians. Here's one that you may find surprising. Jimmy Carter in 1981, uh, appointed a, a committee, it was called the Geminac Committee, the Graduate Medical Education National Advisory Committee, which concluded that there was an excess of approximately 70,000 physicians that will exist in 1990. And to face the future surplus, Geminac Committee recommended that U.S. medical schools decrease enrollment levels by 10%. This was a very distinguished group of individuals. These were deans, presidents of universities, presidents of um, foundations, 
uh, thoughtful individuals, and yet they were 180 degrees off the mark, in part because they weren't in the trenches. They didn't see the development in molecular biology that was about to bloom. They didn't look at this old hospital in Wimbledon, England, where I uh, spent some time, where the CT scanner was developed in the basement. This is uh, uh, Godfrey Hounsfield went on to win the Nobel Prize for this. Jamie Ambrose, the neuroradiologist, uh, uh, RAF fighter pilot uh, in World War II. These guys revolutionized, just not neurosurgery, just not ne ne neurology, but all of medicine. I would venture everybody listening to my talk tonight has had a CT or MR scan, and it's profoundly expanded the territory of all of medicine. And here in the JAMA in 2017, they're saying, well, how come uh, we didn't expand the number of medical students? The Geminet report froze the, the expansion of medical schools. You can think about it. Governor is approached by the dean of medical school, the president of the university, and wants to expand the medical school numbers. And the governor points to the Geminac report on his desk, says, sorry, we're not gonna do it. Private donors constricted, restricted their grants and giving to medical uh, schools. Even private in institutions, private universities did not expand the number of slots in the medical uh, in medical schools, so we're still digging our way out from this from this recommendation by the Geminac uh, committee. And you know, it's, it's amusing to me that when the wall came down, so Soviet state planners lost their job. But guess what? American medical planners in 2021, they're still on the job. I see Randy. You perhaps can't see him. He's embarrassed by his dad giving these political comments, but it's, it affects patient care. Okay, how do you manufacture neurosurgeons? So we're gonna look here at the neurosurgery fac factory. So the neurosurgery factory, where is it located? Every training program in neurosurgery is located in a university or academic medical center. And that has strengths and nuts and negatives, positives and negatives. It has strengths because after all, university is a center of inquiry. There are collaborators in research, collaborators in education, but sometimes there are constraints within universities. Sometimes it's difficult to, to change approaches that have been in place for years, decades, sometimes centuries. The, the, all the departments of uh, in the university are guided by the faculty codes. It makes it very difficult to dismiss faculty members. Although I do know of one case where uh, they found out the faculty member was a card carrying member of the Republican party. And of course he was dismissed right away. Okay, here's the location. <laughs> I see Jacob laughing, Randy's of course very upset at his dad, but nevertheless. Okay, there are 102 training programs in neurosurgery, and they are producing about 160 residents per year. They're all within the university. What's the supervision? Well, there's local supervision, that's by the chairman of the department and the residency program uh, director, but the American Board of Neurological Surgery like the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, Ophthalmology, Internal Medicine. These are self-regulating boards, uh, not government controlled. Um, and the, co the courts, both at the state and federal level, have given this supervisory um, uh, boards great deference. They regulate then the number of residents that can be trained in each program in each hospital, and they in turn have an action arm which goes around every three to five years and examines the training sites and makes sure that the quality is as 
uh, the department's claim. What are the constraints on production? I've already spoken about, uh, well, no, case volume and academic productivity are key if you want to expand your program. Say you have only one resident a year, the majority of neurosurgery programs are only one or two residents per year. If you want to expand, you have to show that you have sufficient case volume to train a resident and that your faculty is uh, being uh, academically productive. Finances, the average cost per resident is about 1.7 million over seven years. And that comes in part from the graduate medical education component of Medicare. And the rest then comes from the department and the hospital. And as a chair and program director, it was my job then to go and bargain with the, with the hospitals and the um, medical school to see if we could incur additional support from them. What's interesting, the Congress passed in 96, the Balanced Budget Act, that capped the amount of money that could go for training. So here we have, as you'll see, supply chain limitation, that is the graduate, uh, graduating medical students, and we have a financial uh, constriction. And yet, as there's a big cry by the public, we need more neurosurgeons or orthopedic surgeons or dermatologists or internists. It's a real problem that Merck is gonna to have to face. And then there's another restriction that came about uh, related to duty hours, restriction on how many hours a resident can work. When I was a resident, uh, there was no restriction and you could be in the hospital for weeks or 36 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, I like to say, well, those were the days of uh, wooden ships and men of iron, uh, but it didn't last. Um, there was an outcry about the work-life balance uh, and then uh, increasing divorce rate, psychiatric problems uniquely with some specialties, but not others. In any event, there was a sentinel event right here in Manhattan where a young woman died after being admitted to a prominent hospital in Manhattan. And then there was a big investigation and New York then set up this commission which said, okay, residents can only work for 80 hours. And at 80 hours in one second, they have to leave the hospital or the hospital will get fined, the department will get fined and so forth. And it soon spread throughout the country. And the question has come up, are the residents being trained as well? Because if I were in the hospital working 36 hours out of 48, and now they're only in the hospital for eight hours a day, something's got to give somewhere. And one of the ways it's given is that the training programs have been lengthened. Okay, with that, let's turn to something more positive. Advances, so there've been significant advances uh, over the four decades with the main contributors coming from contiguous disciplines. I've shown you already the impact of CT scanning and MRI. Further understanding of basic sciences, physiology, anatomy, molecular biology, and uh, perhaps the best example relates to the COVID vaccines. The people who started working, two individuals uh, at the University of Pennsylvania on mRNA technology absolutely had no real interest in vaccines. And that comes in to serendipity. It just so happens they laid the groundwork for then subsequently in 2020 for the vaccines to be developed that, uh, in rather rapid fashion. And then systems biology, which really means computational uh, advances by computers, allows 
better and more complete analysis of brain activity. So let's look at a few cases. Here's a 44 year old man with new onset of seizures. And prior to CT scanning, this person would have been seen by a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. And um, they'd say, well, he may have late onset epilepsy, we're not sure. Let's give him any seizure medication and send him off and see him back every six months or so. Here's what his MR scan showed. He's got a tumor right here. And if you look carefully, here's the, for example, motor cortex here, parietal lobe here. You see the sulci nicely. And then here, you can't see them. That's because the tumor has a grown, obliterated the spaces here. That's more evident here. Here's the normal side and uh, MR slices are reversed in the axial plane. This is the left side, this is the right side. Notice that you can't see the soul sign there. Here's a different view with a different sequence. This again, MR scanning started out with maybe two sequences. Now there are dozens of sequences. You can look at the water content, the fat content, and each of these new sequences reveals a different component of the brain and the brain pathology. And each sequence requires a lot of time and a lot of thought and eventual development. Here's another aspect, same patient, but we're able to define where the central sulcus, the motor strip one side, sensory, so we know in advance. We don't go in and say, well, we're not sure, let's take that out. Then the patient wakes up paralyzed. Again, just to remind you, this is the motor cortex. Here's the sensory cortex. And this then defines the, the, the end of the frontal area and the beginning of the parietal region. So now, Okay, here it is, we measure, we know precisely, motor cortex is now back here, and we go in and open the brain. So let me get you oriented, and I hope I'm not grossing out some of you, but here's the front, anterior, nose here, ear here, midline here, back of the head here. And just looking at this, prior to MR, you know, we would be saying, oh, we're not sure, it looks, Looks maybe this soul sigh, uh, uh, you know, it's a little cramped. Uh, maybe this gyrus, gyrus seems a little fattened. So you might say, okay, well, we'll take a biopsy. We're not sure, but because of the MR, we know this is all tumor. And uh, we have more ways in addition to the MR, we want to confirm where we are. We put this electrode in and we can stimulate the electrode in the motor area here. And the anesthesiologist will be watching his hand and we'll see his hand twitch when we stimulate here. And then we can also stimulate his finger with an electronic pencil, not quite as simple as this, more complex. And we can pick up the impulses back here. So we say, okay, sensory's back here motors here, we're safe to go ahead and take all this out. And this is what happens here now, we've removed the tumor. Without MR, this could not really be done. Okay, here's another area that neurosurgeons deal with and that's the vascular. And I'm gonna cover three areas of vascular disease. The first is arterial venous malformation then aneurysms, and then stroke. So first of all, a little refresher, not in neurophysiology and anatomy, but general vascular anatomy. Here's the heart. It pumps out oxygenated blood up through various organs. In this case, it's the brain. Through the capillaries, the oxygen's uh, extracted, goes into the tissue, deoxygenated blood then leaves, comes back to the heart, pumped through the lungs, reoxygenated, and repeated over and over again. In AVM, arterial venous malformation, is a short circuit, doesn't have a capillary system. And as a result, the arteries 
increase in diameter, and the veins, thin walled, increase in diameter, but then face uh, arterial pressure. And in addition, aneurysms can develop in the wall of these feeding arterioles. This is what it looks like to the artist. Here's an MR. So you can see, this is the normal region. This is the front of the brain, back of the brain, left side, right side. And on the right side, non-dominant in this right-handed uh, patient, you can see this, these massively enlarged veins primarily. So it's the hemorrhoid in the brain. And this is what an arteriogram looks like. An arteriogram is when they put a catheter here into the carotid artery, inject dye with the blood, comes up, and here's sort of normal circulation. Here is this massive shunting short circuit between dilated arteries and massively dilated veins. This is a dilated vein. That's as big as a vein in your leg. So here's a new approach. We just don't go in and operate uh, because uh, the, if, you, if you start bleeding in an AVM, big AVM, the patient can exsanguinate in a matter of minutes. So this, this is approach called preoperative embolization. What happens is that catheters put in the femoral artery here, fed up the aorta in the carotid artery and out to the abnormal arteries and they inject the neuroradiologist, goes in there, comes out here, they inject these small particles. And this just shows, this is the catheter here, coming up here, carotid artery, out the middle cerebral artery, out to the abnormal vessels. So here's the arteriogram, comes up like that, boom. And then they inject these particles and clog up the feeding vessels. So here's pre-embolization, here's post-embolization. So the amount of blood that is shunning through the AVM is radically decreased. Now, it's just not one shot. The neuroradiologists have to go through and pick out individual arteries and make sure they're not injecting these small particles in arteries going to normal brain. But by doing this, it makes the operation safer. And so we can go in. Here's pre-op, and here it is post-op. This is the bone flap that we've removed, we've gone in. And you can see the AVM is gone. Okay, shift of topic, still in the quote, stroke area, cerebral aneurysms. Outpoaching out po poaching of, or sac of an artery, which has a propensity to burst and a high likelihood of killing the patient. And if the aneurysm isn't fixed, it's high likelihood the, the aneurysm is gonna rupture again. So you're talking about 50% mortality in many of these cases. And cerebral aneurysms for at least 50 to 75 years were treated by open surgery, a craniotomy and clipping, and I'm gonna show you that. And there were a host, three, 400 different types of clips and different angles, because when you got in there, you would have to apply different angle, different length clips, some clips in which a blood vessel could go through here and the aneurysm would be clipped here. So real uh, advancing in, advancement in engineering. Here's what these operations look like to uh, Frank Netter, a Brooklyn uh, artist. Uh, the incisions here, patients asleep, open the covering of the brain, tease up, retract the frontal lobe, tease down the, the temporal lobe, and you come down and here's the optic nerve, here's the carotid artery entering into the brain, and here are various aneurysms. This is the middle cerebral artery, here's the anterior cerebral artery. So that's what it looks like to the artist, here's what it looks like to the surgeon, here's the skin incision, that line, now we're going down, here's the temporal lobe, frontal lobe, Orbit is over here, 
the nose is here. Now you can see, here's the carotid artery. We're deep into the brain, not into the brain. We're not going through the brain. We're going around the brain. So here's the carotid artery. Here's the optic nerve. Optic nerve, carotid artery. And we're going to follow the anterior cerebral over here for the, and clip this aneurysm. Here's the anterior cerebral on the right side. Here's the anterior cerebral on the left side. And the aneurysm is here. You've seen this particular aneurysm. Hadn't ruptured, but you can see this little bleb probably was going to rupture. And here's a clip being applied. One aneurysm, different aneurysm. This is what it looks like to the artist. This was the aneurysm before we clipped it. So that's the way aneurysms were treated up until about um, the mid 90s when an interventional approach was developed. And it's similar to what I showed you with embolization of AVMs. So you go in through the femoral artery, feed the catheter up right to the base of the artery and then fill the aneurysm from the inside. There's no opening the head, no operation. Patients is asleep, but it's all done in the angiogram suite. And here's what it looks like, ideally. Here's the aneurysm. Here's the catheter coming up and the neuroradiologist or the neurosurgeon fills the aneurysm with these fine threads of metal, which then attract blood and clotting occurs. And so here's what it looks like. Here's the same area aneurysm that I showed you in the operation, anterior communicating. This is the carotid coming up, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, aneurysm. Now here it is, this white area is the metal, which doesn't let x-ray through. So it appears to be, uh, you can't see it. That's where the, all the uh, small wires have been implanted. Now the last area in the vascular area is what I think most people would call a stroke. It's the interruption of brain blood flow which causes a decrease in delivery of oxygen and glucose. And the cause is frequently an embolus. That means a piece of tissue, which comes from the heart, blood clot, or a feeding vessel, the carotid artery, such as a plaque or a piece of uh, cholesterol. It's very time sensitive, as you've heard from me before. The brain can't live without oxygen and glucose. And Unlike aneurysms, even brain tumors, each of which about affect about 30,000 patients a year in the US, this is a significant public health burden. 800,000 patients a year have a stroke. So how did we use to treat stroke? Well, we really didn't. There was nothing we could do, put the patient in bed, keep the blood pressure elevated. And then in the 1980s, an intravenous therapy was developed, which was clot busting. In other words, blood thinners to restore blood through the blood, blood flow. Uh, and the um, clot busters dissolved the clot, but guess what? It didn't affect plaque or cholesterol from the carotid artery and elsewhere. So it was somewhat effective against stroke caused by clot. And as I previously mentioned, it was uh, time sensitive. Uh, so it was by and large a step forward, but it wasn't uh, you know, a magic bullet. Now here's again to emphasize the adv advances that have occurred in the neuro neurology area that it was mandatory to first perform a CT scan. Because if the patient presented, and it's hard to know whether the patient has had a hemorrhage in the brain or whether it's from obstruction of a blood vessel. Well, let's say patient comes in and you think it's a stroke from an obstruction and you give them clot busting. What happens is the hemorrhage is gonna get much larger and probably call, cause uh, grievous harm uh, to the patient. So. Without the CT, this therapy would not have been possible.
Now that's changed. In, 2000, in seven years, and change is now occurring, I think, at a faster rate, there was developed a new technology in which it was mechanical removal, not medical, med medical application of clock busters, but a mechanical removal of the obstruction. You know, like a, a, the analogy is to a rotor rooter. Uh, and here's, here's, here's what happens. Again, it's the same technique in through the femoral artery up to the clot or where the obstruction is, and you remove the obstruction and restore blood flow. Now, here's how it happens. There are many techniques to do to achieve this. But basically, there's, it, this is one approach. They have a double lumen catheter, which they put in like this. And the inner, inner catheter, they apply suction and they put it next to the clot and they either dissolve the clot, remove the clot by sucking it away, or it attaches to the plaque and they pull it back into this larger catheter and then withdraw it down like this. And look at, here's the, here is um, pictorially well demonstrated. And this is from um, the book. Here you, we can see the idealized um, picture. Here's the carotid artery, anterior cerebral, where the aneurysm that I showed you was located. But here we come out to the middle cerebral and it stops because there's a obstruction within the artery. And this component of the brain is destined to die. So here's an arteriogram you can see, injection of contrast coming up the carotid, anterior cerebral here, anterior cerebral here, middle cerebral here, and look, it just stops. So they put this catheter in, coming up here, and then they advance the smaller catheter, apply suction, and lo and behold, reestablishment of flow right here. And what happens? What does this really mean? The patient is gonna walk out of the hospital. Without this approach, patient would be in the ICU, neurology or neurosurgery bed, rehab, and maybe six months later would walk out of the hospital, but not using the left side of his body. Okay, so with that, let's, let's look a little bit into the future and then I'll stop. First of all, we're gonna talk mainly about functional uh, neurosurgery. And what's going on today, let me show you in movement disorder. By movement disorder, we mean Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. And the treatment is deep brain stimulation or DBS. Now, what is DBS? They place electrodes into specific targets and we're talking about millimeter to submillimeter targeting. That can only occur because of the advancement of instrumentation. There's a halo applied to the patient's head and then uh, very precise instruments used to slowly advance these electrodes into the brain. And at the same time, they're recording. And they know that the uh, characteristic signal to treat Parkinson is, in, is one air, uh, display, whereas for a central tremor, it might be a different pattern. And they advance it, and when they get the right signal, they leave it there, and they bring the electrodes down here to the battery. And so they then apply deep brain stimulation, DBS. Let me just show you, and here, here's an x-ray, boom. And it ends here. If it ended right there, do you see how little I moved it? It may not be effective. Or as they found out, it may stimulate other things. They, they found out that malplacement of an electrode precipitated deja vu phenomenon. That's, you know, memory regeneration, which you'll see perhaps may be a, a future use for deep brain stimulation. All right.
Let me show you. I'm going to stop it. This is the patient with a central tremor. And he is asked to hold his hand steady. It's not at rest that he has a tremor. It's intention tremor. So they say, hold your hands steady. And look what happens. He cannot hold his hands steady. Now, I'm going to roll it back so you can see and stop it. Try it one more time. This is post-op. This is pre-op. Now watch what happens when he tries to pour some water from one cup to the other. Pre-op, post-op. I mean, that is a dramatic advance. And yet, they're not done. Here, in this chapter, these folks in, in uh, Switzerland, I believe, um, are finding that there's some degradation with time. And so they're trying to determine whether they're better targets uh, for this therapy. All right, so that's where we are today. Here's kind of where we are today, but a look into the future. There are a variety of, uh, you know, the question is, are these diseases or abnormalities? So depression. Here's a series of a small number of patients that uh, in scan looking at, and now these are seriously depressed patients, been institutionalized, suicide attempts. These are not folks who are depressed because, you know, the Red Sox lost uh, last night or the Yankees didn't get into the World Series. I mean, you have to be pretty impervious if you're a Jets or, or Giants fan uh, not to be affected. But here they noticed that in, in this area of the brain, so here's the front of the brain, back of the brains here. This is the corpus callosum. This is called nucleus accumbens. And they noticed that in depressed patients, seriously, that there was a seeming abnormality here. So they, they decided that uh, this was Helen Mayberg, who was then at Atlanta, now at Sinai. She's a psychologist, psychiatrist, experimental psychologist. And uh, the neurosurgeons at Toronto decide, okay, we're gonna put electrodes in this area and Deep brain stimulation. And I know that most of you probably are not reading the New York Times, but rather the Financial Times. Here's deep brain stimulation for treatment. Resistant depression shows promising preliminary results. Well, that was in 2013. And what they found was that there was a decrement in success. So now here, New York Times, just three weeks ago, a report out of uh, Stanford, but a pacemaker for brain uh, has had a significant impact. Now, what's the difference between what was going on in Toronto and what was just reported in early October? This is the actual paper. Uh, and basically it came about, and I mentioned this, systems analysis. So it allowed individual application rather than saying, okay, nucleus accumbens, that's what we're targeting. No, their approach at Stanford was to try and individualize and find specific circuits in the nucleus accumbens area that was should be targeted. So it allowed individual treatment. And what else was different is that the patient can stimulate the electrodes themselves. So if they feel depressed, boom, they stimulate this handheld stimulator. And I think the question I think that you have to think about is this based on the Brave New World uh, book by uh, Huxley, is this the electronic soma? Soma was the medicine that everyone was fed uh, to keep them calm. Okay, let's look at 
Another area of potential expansion, growth industry for neurosurgery, memory and motor augmentation via machine brain uh, interface. Well, I showed you one example of memory augmentation. Uh, we don't know what the results are here, but, and I'm, I'm gonna move on from memory. It's, it's very complex and it's hard to demonstrate uh, in contrast to motor or sensory augmentation. And it builds on what you've now mastered, your neuroanatomy and neurophysiology, the motor cortex and sensory cortex. So what is, and this is from chapter in um, a book, I can't see it, the number, but in any event, uh, what is a neuroprosthetic? It's a device that supplements uh, or supplants neurologic function via an artificial interface with the user's nervous system. Really sounds like science fiction, but it's happening. On the motor side, motor cortex, control of volitional movements of a robotic arm or leg, and, or reanimation of a paralyzed extremity from a spinal cord injury or an impairment. And of course, the extreme is an exoskeleton. So I'm going to show you examples of that. Let's look at the sensory side. That's a, except for cochlear implants, it's a little harder because mastery has not been achieved in simulating the small, which someone recently, uh, two individuals won the Nobel Prize, simulating the ability of, for example, the index finger to tell the difference between light touch, deep touch, pain, temperature, those things. So it's an engineering limitation at the present time. But let's look at the motor system uh, advances. Now, here is a remarkable and somewhat frightening uh, demonstration. This young man, as you can see, and I'm going to stop momentarily here, had a bad electrical burn, both of the right hand and the left hand. The left hand was totally destroyed. And what you're going to see in this uh, video is that he can still think, send impulses down to his forearm saying, move my hand. Now, it's crude movement, but nevertheless, it's movement, all right? It's not fine movement, fine finger movement. Now, when the impulse comes down to these muscles, there's sensors here, almost in a blood pressure cuff-like arrangement, wires going off into this artificial hand. And at some point, they're going to amputate his impaired hand and attach this so that it'll have a, a functional hand. Let's see this. Here, we're going to see now Yes. What you just saw, just to make this clear, there's not someone hidden under this table pulling some strings like in a magic show. He is thinking, move my left hand. Impulse comes down here, sensed. It's, those impulses are uh, integrated, There's sent out over these wires to the hand. Let's see that again. Now look, he's smiling and the hand's still moving. Now that's not too strange. After all, look, I'm talking and moving my hand. You know, that's exactly how the motor system works. I'm gonna show you one time. I mean, I guess if children are watching, it's kind of scary. Again, there's not someone under the table Manipul manipulating this hand. And as you'll see, now they've amputated the dysfunctional and he can use this hand, simple grasp, re relaxation. But my prediction is not too far down the pike. Once they are able to uh, figure out sensation, um, 
they're going to have a fully integrated hand with flying finger movements. And this work comes out of uh, the Imperial College in London and in Vienna, but in many places around the world, including Israel, uh, this is ongoing activity. Here's a different, you now this is the second area of motor uh, uh, mach mach um, machine motor integration. This is a woman who's totally paralyzed from the neck down. Looks like she's got, you know, wearing tefillin, but this is um, the sensors that have been impl implanted into her motor cortex, all right? Even though she's been paralyzed, she can still think, okay, move my right hand. Now, of course, the transmission doesn't go through the spinal cord because it's impaired. Instead, comes down here and they've implanted electrodes on nerves in the patient, in patient's hand and she can move her hand. So, okay, two more examples of what's gonna happen in the future, obesity and anorexia. Well, what I didn't talk about when I talked about the pituitary gland shown here, is that the pituitary gland, which sends out all these messages to the thyroid and so forth, the pituitary gland in turn is under the control of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus has many small nests of neurons that are super specialized. Some can sense the glucose level in your brain. Some can sense the osmotic content of the blood. If you're dry, uh, you know, you, the, a signal will be sent out via the pituitary, says, hey, I'm thirsty, have a drink of water. And so the it also uh, is the center for feeding and satiety center. Well, this obviously will lead and has already led to treatments of obesity. Think about banding, that's the present approach to obesity. You know, they put something around the stomach, mechanical obstruction. Those patients are still hungry. So they haven't been cured of their brain problem, I hate to say brain disease, but that's where the real dysfunction is. It's not in their stomach. And same with anorexia. So deep brain stimulation, it's ongoing. Here are two chapters from the next volume, uh, looking first at obesity and anorexia. It's a real thing. I think over the next five to 10 years, it's going to become a major uh, focused in the neurosciences. And then lastly is addiction. Um, we all recognize that addiction is a national scourge, just not in the United States, but throughout the world. And the reality is that our present treatments of addiction are not very successful. Once again, like depression, like obesity, anorexia, Addiction is a brain dysfunction or a brain disease. And sure enough, neurosurgeons, neurologists, and neuroscientists are actively pursuing, mainly in animal models, treatment of addiction through manipulation of the brain. So having made these predictions, I'm going to close with trying to uh, uh, issue some caveats, some coverage. Uh, in 1999, the uh, Lancet, the most widely read journal of medical journal in the world, asked 100 people to write on various topics, mainly their specialty. And I was privileged to, to be asked to write on the next 100 years of neurosurgery. However, uh, in doing so, I wanted to uh, cover uh, my took us, and we had in the article this caveat that rational prediction of the future is an oxymoron. Protective, uh, predictive accuracy would probably be higher by uh, Isaac Asimov rather than academics, limited by conservative scientific methods 
and trained skepticism. And here's a picture of Isaac Asma. Randy's a big sci-fi fan, and, and so I have him also. Uh, he was born in Russia and came to Manhattan. But there's some other profound uh, philosophers also who have an opinion on this, and perhaps this one might be more familiar. Uh, we all know him, Yogi Berra, who said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So with that, uh, I apologize for running over, but thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dad. That was amazing. Um, so there are a few questions that have come over the transom and uh, two of them, well, one of them relates to some, some advice you've given me over the years. Um, can you give any thoughts about youth participation in football? Uh, and maybe to a lesser extent soccer, although, you know, you've directed at soccer uh, as it related to grown-ups participating in soccer being me. That is a uh, difficult question to answer with complete authority. So, um, as you know, I had a big interest in head trauma and spinal cord trauma. Um, I was happy that your sister decided not to play football. Um, <laughs> and I was glad that, you know, it, Randy was a real shrimp until I guess you were about 16 and then all of a sudden, boom, he grew. So football was out. I, uh, you know, and I know the people involved, um, with, on the safety committees of the NFL, two of my former faculty members. Uh, the, um, I mean, I, I would, uh, I, in fact, I advised your, uh, Allison's son, who was very interested in playing football. I said, please, and gave him the marshmallow test. Uh, and, and, you know, he, in, in turn, he decided to play ice hockey. Um, but fortunately gave that up for tennis. I, I, um, I'm trying to be as uh, careful as possible here, but I would not want my uh, progeny to play football. Um, well, you, you've given me that advice before. And, uh, and, and told comes me to, not, to, not to head the ball as well. So, so uh, many of you know, Randy's played on the American uh, soccer team in, in um, the Maccabee games three times in Pan American games and Debbie and I would go and Randy would say look dad stop worrying I'm not going to head the ball and of course he used to occasionally head the ball but yeah well the, it turns out for, for girls soccer and lacrosse are have the highest um, concussion rate. Uh, and certainly the younger you are, the ratio of your head to your body is greater. And consequently, the bubblehead effect or bobblehead effect and the real injury to the brain is uh, velocity deceleration injuries that shake up the brain. So they, their necks at a young age are not strong enough to support their heads in proportion to the body in young kids. I played football in junior high, and it, I mean, I can blame that on a lot of um, problems, like not being able to wash the dishes. And constantly <laughs> no, you know what? Okay, I, I'll go away. I, I, I think... Football is um, something to be avoided. Not All right. football. Here, here's another one that you will think should be avoided. Uh, and it's not related to brain surgery, but someone asked about the effect of, the, of marijuana on the brain. Ah, uh, well, thank you for, you know, throwing 105 mile an hour basketballs <laughs> just on the corners. Uh, well, Randy smiling because he knows my 
thoughts on this. I, I think that it's a gateway drug. There's going to be, I get, I hope that no one can uh, discern where we live, but I think it is a gateway drug. If you look at the statistics in Colorado and Alaska, that were some of the earliest uh, states to pass legalization of marijuana, uh, the accident rates and the death rates went up. Um, one it's, of the- uh, It's actually, everyone who asked that question and others should read a book called Tell Your Children, which was written by a guy named Alex Berenson, who's a New York Times bestselling author. And uh, his wife was a prosecutor in Brooklyn and she prosecuted very heinous crimes. And she, he asked her, what, what do you see that's similar in all these crimes? And her answer was, um, you know, there's always marijuana involved. And she, he thought she was crazy. And anyway, it's, it's uh, the link between that and, and schizophrenia at times and psychosis is, is uh, scary. Yes. Um, I think we will have the answer um, for, for your great-grandchildren because society, in my opinion, has been bamboozled into accepting the concept that these are not, that, that marijuana is not harmful uh, to the brain. It, it's absolutely clear that um, excessive use Whatever that means, and you can interpret it differently, is bad for the brain, especially the young brain. So um, I would, again, like playing tackle football, I would say it's bad for the brain. Another question, does every aneurysm need to be operated on? No. What characterizes... <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you if you're not playing football and not smoking marijuana at the same time with your helmet on, uh, so <laughs> actually something that I was interested in, as Randy knows, and that is the natural history of cerebral aneurysm. I I and Atkinson Morley's Hospital, which I showed where the CT scanner was developed had one of the largest uh, patient referrals um, in the world. Uh, the year I was there, I think they saw about 900 subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, ruptured aneurysm patients a year, uh, which is enormous. And consequently, they had to, this was long before surgical uh, uh, techniques had been developed that were in any way successful. And they relegated it in large, not 50% of the patients were relegated to bed rest. And I had the opportunity to follow those patients for decades. Um, and what that defined was there was a certain size, a certain age, a certain blood pressure, a certain configuration. All of those things today are much better understood. So probably the most important determinant is the size of the unruptured aneurysm. And, uh, you know, uh, if it's less than three millimeters, less than four millimeters, and you don't have a family history. So if you have a family history that it, it, the increased propensity of the aneurysm to rupture, even at a smaller size, Here's another thing, since we were talking about marijuana, smoking looks like it may increase the propensity to develop aneurysm and perhaps increase likelihood of rupture of aneurysm. So it's, it's multifactorial. And once again, there's not a simple answer uh, to address this question, but no, not every aneurysm needs to be cared for. Great. I point out, you know, um, when I was in medical school and even as a resident, many of the doctors were smoking in the hospitals. And you could say, okay, now here we are. Many individuals in society are saying, well, marijuana is not harmful. 
And now, 50 years later, uh, we find out smoking is bad. One other thing is that there are many aspects of marijuana smoking that haven't been investigated. Recent report suggested strongly that smoking of marijuana in one group of patients and another group of non-marijuana users turned out that the marijuana users had developed hypertension at an earlier age. I mean, that's something you usually don't even think about, the connection. And yet smokers, again, more likely to develop hypertension. So there's a lot of things we don't know about, and yet we've opened the floodgates to the use of marijuana. I, you know, I have a position on that, as you know. And I'm glad you share me, share in that position. All right. Well, this was did I, wait a minute, did I see Jacob up, up <laughs> there and trying to hide that? Jacob. Thank All you, right, Jacob. Before we before we sign off here, any other questions or thoughts? Well, this is uh, the first win Zoom, and Allison has left for the evening, but the next win Zoom is going to be with Allison, and uh, Randy and Doctor Win will uh, organize that and make sure it's great. And Doctor Win, uh, it was well worth the wait. We've been trying to land you. It feels like a year. But it was well worth the wait. It was very informative. And we really want to thank you for your precious time. And we hope to have you back with Allison. And we hope to see you soon. I want to thank uh, Randy again for everything and Rachel and Ezra and everyone. And uh, hope to see you guys all very soon. Have a great evening. Let me thank you before you sign off, Jacob. Let me thank Ezra. Let me thank the rabbi. And let me... <laughs> Thank everybody who's managed to stay awake uh, and still with us. A lot of people still with you, Dr. Wayne. See ya. Thank you. Have a Bye -bye. good evening. Bye-bye.